Sophie, thank you. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. Crisis talks are held over train services in the north. Politicians from our region are demanding action after months of disruption and misery for passengers. It felt like a constructive meeting, but we now need to see the minister take action and start delivering for our communities and our passengers. One train company tells us they're working flat out to fix the problems. Also tonight... An investigation is underway into the death of five-year-old boy from Rotherham. His family say they were turned away from hospital. With temperatures dropping, are the gritters ready for icy conditions? We've been out on the roads in Wakefield. And is this the future of online shopping? We'll take a look at the robots going door-to-door -door in Leeds. Well, for most, it's been another grey and cold day. What about Thursday, Friday and into the weekend? Join me for that detailed forecast. Hello, good evening. Welcome to the programme. Are you a frustrated rail commuter? Well, this year, train cancellations are the highest since records began back in 2015. And it's no secret that rail travel in the north has been severely disrupted in recent months by strikes and cancellations. That's caused misery for thousands of passengers. According to the Office of Road and Rail, one in every 26 trains across Great Britain has been cancelled in the year leading up to the 12th of November. And just this morning, at the height of rush hour, 20% of TransPennine Express services were affected on the Manchester to York route. And for services running through the Hope Valley, that number rose to 56% of trains running late or cancelled completely. Now, these figures don't include services that were pre-cancelled. That can be up to the day before. A good day then for the West Yorkshire Mayor Tracy Brabin and South Yorkshire Mayor Oliver Coppard to meet the new Transport Secretary for the first time. Along with other mayors in the north of England, they've demanded action to end the rail chaos. We'll have more about that in a moment, but first let's hear from one hacked off commuter. So I'm just on my way to the station. Uh, since found out that out of four commuter services this morning, this Fife Estate is the only one that is running. The 8.35 has since been cancelled, so this is expected to be a busy service, especially when we get to Huddersfield. Uh, so let's see how we go on. This is what's awaited me. Can you can see that. Lots of people are trying to cram onto one or two services. Joy, can't wait for the journey home. I'm sure Tracy Braben is doing her best. She gets the same line as me. Uh, but um, the, the fact that they can drop these services just at the drop of a hat, seemingly when people have made plans, is uh, it's just ridiculous and it's not sustainable for them, surely. Something needs to change. John, clearly a bit fed up there. Mm -hmm. Our reporter Tom Ingle has been following the story. Tell us what's happened today, Tom. John, among the many people who've contacted us with their little video diaries, not just today, not just through November, but for months and months now, talking about those frustrations, getting to and from Manchester, Leeds, York, making those basic journeys across the Pennines, not just across the northern Trans-Pennine, southern Trans-Pennine. And as you said, huge percentages just today alone of trains cancelled or very late. And the North has crunched some numbers collectively the, the mayors across the north, and they say it's costing eight million pounds a day in economic damage. So hundreds of millions over a year. And that comes from missed appointments, you can't get to hospital, can't drop your kids off, can't get to a job interview, whatever it is your reason to travel, being disrupted. So a deputation of mayors from across the north went over to see the uh, Secretary of State for Transport, Mark Harper, today. Ironically, of course, uh, Tracy Braben's train among those cancelled as she tried to get to the meeting. That meeting finished about 45 minutes ago. This is some immediate reaction from Oliver Copper, the South Yorkshire Mayor, and also Tra Tracy Braben, the West Yorkshire Mayor. The Minister said he was going to take that away. We now look to see what he does next, frankly. Really positive that he was here. It felt like a constructive meeting. But we now need to see the Minister take action and start delivering for our communities and our passengers. Well, one of the things that can change quite imminently is rest day working, which will mean we can get more drivers so we can have less cancellations. So we made that point. It's uh, really clear that he's got to get round the table and sort that. But also, uh, when we're looking at the whole of the North, that there's going to be that further investment in the long term. But also, TransPennine cannot continue with this poor service without being put on notice. 
So Tracy Braben's got quite a big shopping list there. She wants the investment in the north. She wants a deal on rest day working. But most significantly, she wants TransPennine put on probation. So if they make any more mistakes, they could find it a problem when they try to get uh, their contract renewed to run the trains. We've asked TransPennine today for a statement. This is what they've said to us. They say they've had prolonged disruption affecting services caused by a range of issues, including ongoing high levels of train crew sickness. But they say in normal circumstances, we have enough people to fully operate our scheduled timetable. We have more drivers now than ever before. They've apologised and say their team continues to work flat out to deliver high levels of service delivery and to tackle the issues that are being experienced by customers. Of course, it's not just cancellations. There's strikes and stoppages affecting rail passengers at the moment. What a miserable run-up to Christmas it is. Tom, thank you. Next night, Rotherham Hospital is launching an independent investigation into the death of five-year-old Yusuf Mohammed Nazir last week. Yusuf became very ill with a throat infection and his family say they begged staff to treat him with intravenous antibiotics, but they were told they got no beds. Yusuf was eventually admitted to Sheffield's Children's Hospital, but tragically he died on the 23rd of November. His family believes he could have been saved if he'd been treated sooner. Earlier I spoke to Yusuf's uncle. I asked him how the family's coping. Yeah, it's quite very, very difficult times for us at the moment. Um, it's just very, very hard to sink in that uh, this has happened and uh, Yusuf won't be coming back. And it's, it's very, very hard. Um, we always expecting that minute he might be walking through the door, he might be walking through the door. Um, it's just very, very hard to establish. It's happened so quick unexpected um, and it's it's just it's just an absolute big shock so so he wasn't he wasn't admitted to Rotherham hospital no. why do you think he didn't get the care that he needed at Rotherham I'm, I'm, it's for them to give me the answers we want answers from them of why why he didn't get the care um, so many people put the you know put the, they put their lives in their hands they give them the responsibility to give us the treatment um, They've they've failed on many things, but we want to know why they failed, and, and we want them to accept that they failed, and we want it to. We don't want this to happen to anybody else. So you know, we're not going to get Yusuf back. Um, it's very very sad that we're not going to get him back, and it's cost his life for them to realise that there's been some there's been some failings. Well, Rotherham Hospital say that a full independent investigation will now take place. Do you have? some hope that lessons have been learned so this doesn't happen again yeah this is uh, this is yeah we definitely this is what we want we want action to be taken immediately it's not something that an independent investigation might take weeks months might take a year but we want to get them to put changes in place now because it's too late if it costs another couple of lives or it costs another life or if it costs somebody who to become seriously ill that's enough for them to to, to make changes, they've they've gone to the they've gone to the limits. So here, thank you for coming in, and please do pass our condolences on to the rest of the family. Won't you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So tragic. Rotherham Hospital told Look North, we know that this will not relieve the family's loss and pain. However, we are commissioning a thorough and independently led investigation into the whole pathway of Yusuf's care. Yusuf's MP, Shara Champion, has been working with the family. She's welcomed today's news, but says she'll keep pushing to make sure that investigation takes place quickly. I am so relieved that the wants and needs of the family have been listened to and we're going to get this independent inquiry. And the independent is the key bit of this because it can't be a cover up. It can't be internal. It has to be really robust and transparent. So we absolutely get to the bottom of how and why Yusuf died so that no other children faces that risk. You're watching Wednesday's Look North still to come on tonight's programme. A little bit of festive fun in Featherstone will be uh, live at a big light switch on. But someone who's probably not in the festive spirit, the owner of a poultry farm in North Yorkshire that's been decimated by bird flu, says it's been the worst year of his life. In September, Ed Wilkinson lost his entire flock of chickens to the disease and now 12,000 turkeys he was rearing have had to be destroyed too. It's led to growing concerns of a turkey shortage this Christmas, with shoppers been told they'll have to compromise on the traditional Christmas dinner this time. Phil Connell reports. 
There's three and a half weeks till Christmas, and for Britain's turkey farmers, it should be their busiest time of the year. But at Shire Farm near Easingwold, it's a Christmas the likes of which they've never seen before. Sadly, we can't go beyond here, um, but uh, usually we would have 45 staff working on this site this time last year, and it really would be a hive of activity. It's just over a week since bird flu was confirmed on Ed Wilkinson's farm, and within two days he had to witness 12,000 turkeys being slaughtered. It was just devastating, and, and sadly it's the second time we've gone through it. It's uh, twice in two months we lost our chickens to it. We just managed to scrape ourselves up off the floor uh, with Christmas in sight, and we really did think we were going to make it to Christmas, and, um, you know, it all happened again. Some of Ed's turkeys would normally be sold at this butcher's shop in York. Its owner says alternatives are available for Christmas, but customers need to be realistic. I think people need to uh, understand the situation with the bird flu and um, maybe compromise and, uh, and redesign the Christmas dinner, really. And you've never known anything quite like this? No, no, not at all. Uh, new territory altogether. On many poultry farms, though, questions are now being raised as to what's being done to tackle the outbreak. Farmers like Ed say a vaccination programme, at least for domestic birds, is the best and only option. And without it, the problems next year will be even worse. If the vaccination programme doesn't come forward, free-range production is not going to exist in its current form. It is a real struggle to see which way we can go producing free-range poultry without knowing your bird has got some uh, protection from a vaccine. Ed hopes the government's compensation scheme will go some way to help cover his losses. For many breeders, though, it's a Christmas they'd sooner forget. And for those looking forward to a traditional Christmas dinner, there may be consequences too. Phil Connell, BBC Look North, North Yorkshire. Let's bring you up to date with some of the stories coming into our newsroom now. A 51-year-old man has appeared in court charged with murdering his parents at their home in Sheffield. Mary and Brian Andrews, who were in their 70s, died at their home in Terry Road in Totley on Sunday. Their son, James Andrews, who's also known as Duncan, has been remanded in custody. Almost 1,500 ambulance workers have voted to strike across Yorkshire. They'll join paramedics, call handlers and other staff across the county in a walkout over the government's imposed pay award of 4%. Strikes are likely to start before Christmas, but the rules requiring emergency care to be provided mean the impact will be limited. The West Yorkshire MP Stuart Andrew has been praised for wearing a One Love armband at last night's England-Wales game at the World Cup. The Pudsey Horsforth and Airborough MP was in Qatar in his role as sports minister. Mr Andrew, who is gay, wore a symbol on his arm to promote diversity and inclusion. Many players had also planned to wear the armband before FIFA threatened them with instant yellow cards. A 14-year-old boy has been treated in hospital with serious injuries after being hit by a car in Leeds during the morning rush hour. West Yorkshire police say it happened on the A64 York Road at quarter past seven while he was trying to cross. The westbound carriageway was closed for most of the morning. An investigation is underway and officers are asking anyone who may have witnessed the accident to get in touch. The Director of Public Health for Leeds is warning that a new wave of Covid will hit the city after Christmas. Victoria Eaton also said uh, that the take-up rates for the Covid booster and flu jabs were not as high as she'd hoped. Although older people are getting their vaccines, around 40% of the under 65s who are eligible um, to have theirs. The rate for pregnant women is even lower at 21%. She said hospitals are currently dealing with low rates of Covid but very high rates of flu and there seemed to be an element of vaccine complacency among patients. Doncaster Council has called on the Civil Aviation Authority to delay decommissioning airspace at Doncaster Sheffield Airport. Now, you may remember the airport closed early this month and removing the airspace would make any possible reopening more difficult. Peel Group, who own the 800-acre site, say there has been no material change to the facilities since they were shut down. Doncaster Council has also launched a legal challenge to the closure. 
Let's move on to cricket now. England's Yorkshiremen are still waiting to hear if their historic test series against Pakistan can begin, as planned in the early hours of tomorrow morning. Yorkshire's Harry Brook will line up alongside Joe Root for England in what will be their first test series in Pakistan for 17 years. But the opening match could be delayed or even postponed because half of the England squad have been hit by a viral infection. Root, however, insists that it's no big drama, really. Yeah, it happens sometimes you go to uh, different countries around the world, you pick up different viruses that you've not been used to or experienced before. And, um, you know, you obviously stay tight together as a group and as a team and these things can, can pass around. So we don't think it's COVID, we don't think it's food related. And, you know, we're hoping that it's just a 24 hour bug and everyone feels fit and ready to go tomorrow. Let's hope so. Well, tomorrow is the 1st of December. And with a change in season, we're seeing a change in the weather. It's much colder, isn't it? And drier conditions as well. Wakefield Council says it'll be monitoring the situation overnight. And if the road surface temperature dips below five degrees, grit lorries may be deployed. However, one councillor has admitted it'll be a challenge paying for rock salt this year, especially if it's a long, cold winter. Heidi Tomlinson reports from the Gritting Depot in Wakefield. Truck number three, just getting ready to get loaded up for the night. Britter driver Steve Britton is ready for winter. When we come into the yard, they'll tell us what uh, amount of grams we are applying to the road. This time last year, drivers were out in the thick of it. Very heavy snow, it's, it's a bit uncomfortable, but wipers are on full blast. You've got, um, you've got your red light on for the grits, so you can see your grits working properly. No snow forecast in Yorkshire as yet, but the spreaders have been out responding to a drop in overnight temperatures. So we've got this mountain of rock salt. There are 4,700 tonnes here, Steve. Correct. Could this be enough for Wakefield for the entire winter? Uh, it could be, yes. The council's hoping for a mild few months, as the price of grit has increased by 11%, and filling the trucks with fuel costs almost a third more than last year which means at least an extra £20,000 to keep Wakefield's main roads safe in cold conditions. That will have obviously an impact on our budgets, but them costs will have to be met. We have a statutory duty to grit, as does every local authority in the country. They'll have to afford the cold winter, so no option we've got to do that, but it will be a challenge for all of us. The red line is the road surface temperature, so that's the one that we are really interested in. Weather forecasts are analysed daily to ensure staff and trucks are deployed efficiently. So is there a particular temperature that you look out for as like a trigger? Y yes, for me it's five degrees, broad surface temperature. Driving in icy conditions doesn't face Steve, but other road users can cause problems. You do get some abuse, you get people throwing snowballs at windows. It nearly broke the window because they don't actually just throw snowballs, they put stone and grit in them. I've also had um, some people getting very impatient. They overtake you and the road in front hasn't been gritted and you think they're taking the life into their own hands, really. A plea for patience and respect this winter for those on the night shift spreading a layer of safety on our roads. Heidi Tomlinson, BBC Look North, Wakefield. Now, here's a story I think you're going to like. The number of people doing online food shopping has increased since the pandemic, but it's about to get a bit more advanced. Some people in Leeds can now order food and drink that will be delivered by one of these, a robot. Beth Parsons has been to make an order. So you've made the journey, you've remembered your shopping list and hopefully you've got your bags. But could browsing the aisles be a thing of the past? Because robots are coming to Leeds. Hello, I'm a Starship delivery robot. Robots aren't new. They clean up in Singapore, they've become waiting staff in the Netherlands and they even help with medical treatment here in the UK. As part of a three-month trial, people in the Adel and Tinsel areas can now get what's described as an autonomous food delivery. You order your shop in, go through order like normal. The store team put the shop in inside the robot and then the robot navigates the street autonomously and comes to whatever location you've put. So that could be your house, the park, wherever you may have dropped the pin, the robot navigates itself to you. Around 20,000 people in northwest Leeds can now place an order. The robots move around four miles per hour, which is roughly the speed of somebody walking. And when it comes to energy, it's powered renewably. It uses about the same amount of energy that you would need to boil a kettle for one cup of tea. And don't worry, it can cross the road too. 
The robot itself has got a, a sensor suite of 12 different cameras and sensors. It can tell how fast the vehicle's come towards it, how much time the robot's got to cross, um, and then it can make a judgment call on whether it's safe to cross or not. Um, so when it gets to a crossing, it will originally come to sort of a safe stop, and then it will start looking at the traffic, how much time have I got to cross, um, and making a judgment call if it's got enough time to get across the road safely. If it's not, then it will just wait until it has got a gap and it can go across. The robots will reduce the number of short car journeys made to the shop. So far in the UK, they've saved over a million miles worth of journeys. But there are other benefits too. The uh, advantages to the community, apart from cleaner air quality, is those people who maybe have those neurodiversion disabilities will really benefit from having an autonomous um, delivery system that they can access you know, through their phone or whatever um, without having to um, go anywhere if they have mobility issues or interact with people that they may not want to. Robots like these are already working successfully down south, but this is the first time they've arrived up north. If the trial is successful, Leeds City Council will consider rolling it out to more parts of the city. For now, though, these little robots are waiting for their next order. Thank you. Have a nice day. Beth Parsons, BBC Look North, Adol. Well, I'm joined now by Sandra from Starship Technologies and another very special guest. Wow! Hello, Amy. I'm so happy to be the first Starship robot to make a delivery on BBC Look North. Well, I'm very pleased too. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. What have we got inside then? Have I got any shopping? Oh, there we go. I believe we do. <laughs> it's so bizarre, isn't it? There we go. Uh, what have we got? Oh, we have a bag with oh. some milk, bananas. Oh, thank you. Oh, mince pies, pies. very yes. festive. I'll definitely <laughs> take the mince pies. Thank you very much for very that, welcome uh, indeed. Starship. Now, Sharon, this is fabulous, but what's to stop someone nicking my mince pies when it's you know rolling down the street? Well, first of all, this is one of the more popular questions that we get. Um, overall, I mean, we have been doing this for a while now. We um, we started in the UK back in 2018, so uh, we have globally completed over 4 million deliveries. So we, we know a thing or two about robotic delivery service today. Um, but overall, we have um, lots of very intelligent technology packed into this robot, not just into the hardware, but also the software. So we have tracking to the nearest inch, so we always know where the robot is. Um, the lid is locked when it's in transit, so you can't really get into it. Um, and what about someone kidnapping it? Because it's yes. very pretty. <laughs> it's very cute indeed. Um, if you really try and lift it up, I mean, it's quite heavy, so it does require at least two people. Um, but it will trigger a very loud siren, so and that's not quite pleasant. So um, a lot of hassle to get into. Yeah, into and a lot robot. of technology built in, so actually they can't go anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and can it get festive? Can it play any tunes? It can actually, yes indeed. Um, when you are ordering through our app um, uh, groceries from a local store, you can also select uh, music, which is uh, going to be playing when it arrives to your doorstep. So it's just um, just adding more to the delivery service. And Absolutely. It's well, from tomorrow it can start playing Christmas tunes, can't it? Thank you very, very much. Lovely to no meet worries. you. Because of course, tomorrow is the 1st of December. Are you feeling festive yet? Well, there's only a few hours to go until we can officially turn on Christmas lights. The people of Featherstone in Wakefield are uh, getting in the spirit. It's the town's Christmas light switch on and Hannah Gray is there to meet the special guest who's been nominated to press the button to illuminate the town. Hannah, it's all yours. Yes, hi Amy, there's only 25 days to go till Christmas, can you believe it? And here in Featherstone, everybody's getting very excited. Now, just a few moments ago, the lights were officially switched on by a very special guest, but first, why don't you take a look at that very special moment? Five, four, three, two, one, go! Brilliant, wasn't it? Right, well, this is John. John is the guy who had the privilege of pressing that button and illuminating Featherstone. How did it feel? Right. It was great seeing you do it. Now, Claire, you nominated John. Why did you nominate John? What's so great about him? He's just a special person. Everybody knows John, everybody loves John, and he's just special to Featherston. How did you meet him? Just walking up and down, calling into shops and everything, and just generally on Station Lane. 
Oh, brilliant. Well, it's great how everybody's really gotten behind him. Stephen, you've worked with him for years. Tell me more about John and how it feels to have someone like him included in tonight's amazing event. Well, John's lived in this community for 10 years. It's such a special privilege that this inclusive community has involved him. It's great, actually. It's great for people with learning disabilities and those he lives with and those who work with him every day to recognise what an impact he's had on the community. He lives and works and sees everyone. There's not anyone in Feverson who doesn't know and love John. It's just so fantastic to see for him and everyone else. Well, it was an absolute honour to see you do that, John. You did a great job. And are you excited? Tomorrow you get to open your advent calendar. Yeah. Yeah. Amy, from everyone here, ready? Tomorrow is also when that naughty elf on the shelf arrives. I am not looking forward to that. Are you not? They're always very cheap. Are you putting your tree up this weekend? <coughs> Sorry, I'm here, choking though. on a bit of mince pie oh, here. It well, went down the wrong way. So it's right for eating and talking. Every cloud is a silver lining. Let's have a look at uh, the pictures that you've sent in in the last uh, 24 hours. In search of brightness, deep car in uh, Sheffield there, looking uh, brighter than other areas. A little bit of blue sky there in uh, Whitby. Thanks for that, Scampy. And at the third one, again, well, you have to go high up, but that's stunning, isn't it? That's right at the top of uh, home moss with a bit of low cloud and uh, fog there. But nice to see the sunshine. Well worth the journey. Keep the pictures coming in on Twitter, Instagram and on the Weather Watcher website. So let's have a look at the headline for tomorrow. Well, again, it's another cold feeling day with mostly cloudy skies slightly better chance of seeing some breaks developing especially across more southern and eastern parts of our region but it's a familiar story weather fronts kept well out to the west actually the change over the weekend into next week is that we'll pick up more of a brisk east or northeasterly so there'll be a wind chill developing and showers coming in off the North Sea. And I suppose over the Pennines, tops of the Pennines, those showers might turn wintry as we head into next week. You can see the extent of the cloud on the satellite picture. So it's a fairly still evening and night to come. If we do get any gaps in that cloud sheet, we will see some mist and patchy fog. And there could also be some ground frost in places, temperatures in some rural spots with the clearer gaps close to freezing point. So watch out for one or two icy patches. Uh, so tomorrow's high water times, there we are, file at 10.36, Bridlington at 10.50. So most of us off to a cloudy start, some mist and fog, that will lift into uh, low cloud. And a bit of a brightening process, perhaps, across parts of South Yorkshire, maybe up towards the coast. But the further north and west you go, the more likely you are to run it into that thicker cloud, possibly producing one or two spots of drizzle. Temperatures at best, 7 degrees. As I say, it's another cold-feeling day for the first day of meteorological winter. Further ahead then, as we head into the weekend and early next week, we keep a lot of cloud. Uh, that wind picks up and there's a hint of scattered showers developing, possibly wintry over the tops of the hills. And that's the forecast. Sorry, I don't know if you just heard me there. My what? producer said, did that mince pie go down? Well, I said it went down very well. <laughs> well, have another one and, and stop talking. First mince pie of the season. Very nice. Thank you, Paul. You are mean. Oh, I don't mean it. Can we get the novelty headbands out? Yeah, if you want. You'll wear them. Antlers. I know how you like an antler. Do you want me that's to end the programme? Good bye -bye. night. <laughs>